that you present a PCR test when you're entering the country, but that is routinely a request from that country. So whenever you're going to come to us and ask us for a specific um, test that needs to be um, done for you, you will need to provide evidence that the country is in point of fact requesting it, and you'll also need to provide us with a valid reason as to why you are leaving. So that people that are leaving for non-essential purposes are not routinely being considered to get a PCR test for when you leave. Uh, and I'll use as an example, Guatemala requires that you present a PCR test when you arrive on Guatemalan soil. Mexico doesn't require that. So just to, to give you a note in terms of that, you also don't need it um, when you're going to the US. Um, uh, for Belizeans that are returning, you will note that we are routinely re recommending, not really requiring Belizeans, that, that is, that you bring a PCR test when you come in through the airport within 72 hours. If you cannot bring that, then you will be uh, given a test um, upon arrival at the airport. Um, at the NOC that we had on this past Monday, it was also agreed that returning Belizeans by land which would be through Guatemala or through Mexico, can now also bring a PCR test within 72 hours when they arrive at the land border. If you bring that PCR test and it's determined that that is, um, is clear enough, um, the quarantine officer determines that it's not, that's a valid test, then you will be allowed to go um, in without having to take any other test, just like what's happening at the airport. However, Belizeans that are returning through the land border that do not bring a PCR test will have to get swabbed upon arrival and you will have to go into a hotel to wait until you get your result. Now, why is there a difference between what's happening at the airport and at the land borders is because one, the land border is still closed and two, um, the airport folks that are being allowed to come through are the ones who have gotten a test upon arrival and a PCR test that they bring from outside. We have not been moving towards doing testing with a rapid test at the land borders, which is why you are swabbed and a PCR test is done. Uh, for the last week, I can tell you we are having a delay in terms of the amount of tests that are being processed at Central Medical Lab, so much so that on Sunday, Monday, we had close to 1,000 swabs that were still pending. So I know that there are some level of delay that people are a little bit, uh, you know, it wasn't three days, it's gone to five days. In some instances, it has gone to seven days, uh, especially if you're coming from a rural area, because by the time the swab gets to be elicited and there's a further delay in processing of those samples. However, the lab has been trying to work 24 seven for the last, this week, to try to catch up with all those samples. I'm already getting a preliminary note from the lab director that they will um, be doing a record number of tests today, which means that that's more than 420 samples that will be processed. And I know up to yesterday they had 600, almost 700 samples pending to be processed. So that's one. For Belizeans also leaving um, in terms of a PCR test, and I need to be very, very clear. We are talking about a PCR test that is required. We are only able to swab people on Wednesdays, the ones that are leaving and have been approved to get a PCR test. Um, and we process those samples on Thursdays. So you get your result around this time because before I came here, I signed on to all the samples that were processed throughout the day. And so you get your result around this time. So people would need to factor in their travel, the ones that are traveling to countries that require it around the 72 hours after you get your result, which is you basically have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to be able to leave. Um, lots of concerns, lots of people traveling for different reasons, non-Belizeans requesting, demanding the PCR test, but it is what it is. Um, and Belizeans are having the same difficulty in other places, which is why it's not really a requirement from our end for you to come back home it is a recommendation, but I know some countries, even if you're a returning national, they are demanding that you get a PCR test. Um, the PCR test, uh, for the most part, if you have an essential reason for traveling, which means you're traveling because you have a medical condition that requires medical treatment outside, or you're a student going back to school or starting school somewhere else, you will be, um, those persons don't pay the $100 fee when you're leaving. All other persons that are approved, 
um, would have to pay the $100. Um, we are noting that a couple of private entities have advertised antigen tests for people leaving Belize. I can tell you we do not take responsibility for that and you have to clear it with the country where you are going or with the airline that in point of fact that is the requirement. And I'm stating this because we got a call from somebody who got stranded now in Cancun because they got a rapid test done at a private facility and the airline is not asking for a rapid test, it's asking for a PCR test and the person has already paid this private entity and is asking us for some level of support. We can't do anything with that because we don't even have access to the swab that was taken. And that person, I guess we'll have to find a way of getting a test done um, in Cancun. Um, in terms of the airport, the situation I think is becoming more fluid. We still have a vast amount of persons bringing in a PCR test. Uh, to date, we have had two cases detected in people coming in through the airport via the SD biosensor. So both of those persons would have had to complete their quarantine at the established hotel in Belize City. Um, in terms of the last death that we had yesterday, it's that of a 81-year-old um, male um, diagnosed in Orange Walk who had been uh, at the Northern Regional Hospital uh, from October 8th, I believe. So he was there for almost two weeks. Uh, until he died in the early hours of yesterday uh, morning. Uh, we are reviewing all the lab data and all the data uh, in terms of people who would have had sudden deaths or people who would have died without being referred to Carl Huesner. So um, there's a couple of persons from headquarters that will go to, that will be in Orange Walk um, later on in the week and early next week to review the specific management of those patients and to see if there is any other situation that may be brewing and that we are not aware of. Um, as you would have noted, in terms of the age groups, in terms of people dying, we have had a 26-year-old female. That's the youngest person that has died for our context. Um, so I think we need, we need to be aware of that particular situation. So that person is the youngest is a female and if you notice the infographic that we had published earlier in the week most of the cases of people dying have been in the older um, age group so that now we have 16 people out of the total uh, for the uh, for the six deaths that have been recorded um, that's one third of cases in are in people older than 65 and if you bring down the bracket to people older than 55 that means people in the retirement age that is 34 out of the 46 people that would have died would have been older than 55 years of age but again you look at that data and you find out that as i have said we have had cases and people younger than 30. Um, again when you look at the age groups that are mostly affected Yesterday, we had a continuous medical educa educational session with um, a pediatrician specialist from Spain um, to discuss the management of patients in pediatric populations, seeing if we can look, it, look for it in the Belize context. And um, because the vast amount of patients that have been hospitalized have not been the pediatric population. But when you look at the age group that is most affected, the vast amount of numbers are still going to be those between 25 to 29, 30 to 34, and 20 to 24 um, in that specific number, with males, of course, being um, more likely to be affected than females. So even though you have a younger age group uh, representing the vast amount of, of cases, that doesn't really, um, it's not that in that age specific age group. Um, this morning we had also, um, I think, as we move on in terms of process at the airport, we had a discussion to share our experience of how the airport process flow and the health application has worked for the Belize context. We shared that with um, Trinidad and Tobago, and that was facilitated by the PAHO country office in um, Trinidad and Tobago, Port of Spain, so that we could have looked at um, where we are with our health app and how that can help um, Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the opening of their facility there. 
uh, in terms of where we are with hospitalizations, primarily for or, um, Carl Huchner, and it's important that we flag this because we now have um, uh, the first pediatric case hospitalized now at Carl Huchner's COVID-19 unit. Uh, that's a six-year-old male referred from the Northern Regional Hospital um, who has a specific um, kidney situation now. And his x-ray is documenting that he has a pneumonia, um, which is an infection of, of the lower lung um, portion. Um, he has been uh, hospitalized as of yesterday evening. Uh, currently stable, not requiring supplementary oxygen, but he is the first pediatric case hospitalized at Carl Huchner's COVID-19 unit. Aside from him, there's uh, six other patients at Carl Huchner's COVID-19 unit. One of those is ventilated. Um, two patients are on what we call a high flow of oxygen, and the other persons are with what we call supplementary oxygen, which means you're normally scaling them down uh, in an attempt to try to wean them off the oxygen and see if they're able to tolerate it and whether they'll be able to go um, home after that. That's in terms of Carl Huchner. Um, Carl Huchner and the Northern Regional are the ones we routinely will follow because uh, they are the entities that are having the vast amount of, of, of cases, as you would know. And in terms of the Northern Regional Hospital, they have um, up to today, um, they had only one admission and the patient that uh, trans was transferred earlier to Carl Huchner as well. Um, one person that went self-discharge, which means they decided to go home against medical advice, and one person that was discharged from uh, the hospital home. So uh, Northern Regional had started the day with four patients. Uh, one was sent to Carlucia, one was sent home, one decided to leave the hospital, and one person remains admitted at the Northern Regional Hospital. We are also said we are going to start looking at patients that we are routinely um, discharging home as well, so that we are not only concentrating on the um, negative situations because people are discharged home uh, after they have recovered. So it's not everybody that's um, necessarily having a poor outcome. One piece of good news in terms of what's happening at the um, uh, lab is that we got an extraction machine um, which would mean that there's no manual extraction because once you take a nasal swab, you have to do a, what's called a manual extraction. You have to do a, a, do it one by one processing of samples, which is what causes part of the delay. It also exposes the health staff to handling lab specimens. Um, so that's part of the delay because you have to do it on a, in a manual basis, uh, one by one before you upload it into the machine for interpretation. So now that we have gotten what's called an extraction machine, that will be an automated process, hopefully. Um, the lab is telling me that the preliminary data seems to suggest that they'll be able to take out 96 samples every 20 minutes um, in terms of extraction and then placing it in the machine. If that is the case, then that will be a significant cutback in terms of time. And this is one of two extraction machines that are um, slated to come to Central Medical Lab. This is, extraction machine was bought and uh, donated to the Ministry of Health by uh, Belize Electricity Limited. So there's one other pending machine to come um, our way. Uh, that's, I think, for the most part in terms of where we are with Belizeans that are being tested. The preliminary data for today in terms of samples that we have Processed. We had an initial batch um, earlier today that had um, 267 samples with 26 positives. And then we had a second batch come out with 84 samples and 11 more positives. So at least we will have 37 cases to report today. But as I said, the lab is processing the final batch of data. And they are saying they will have a record number of samples to be um, given to to us. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead without a computer now. Um, yes, I'm getting... F yes. So um, I'm going to go through here. So pardon me if I'm going to be reading the questions directly from 
here in terms of the questions that are start, going to start to come to us now. Um, it says here, um, any information on the recent debt were there underlying factors? I already mentioned that this was an 81-year-old male that had other chronic um, conditions and he had been in the hospital, uh, Northern Regional, for more than um, almost two weeks. Important to say because part of the discussion we had yesterday with the pediatric um, specialist uh, is that he reiterated to us that there is no specific treatment available for both pediatric or adult populations. I think it's important that we stress that because people keep asking us, how are you managing your patients? Reiteration from the specialist, there is no specific treatment for pediatric populations, even when hospitalized, because they are managed based on the symptoms. It's important that we stress that. The study, the, the major study being done by PAHO, WHO, the solidarity trial, um, clearly indicates that none of the therapies that were in the original arm of that study, um, I mean, the lopinavir, ritonavir, the hydroxychloroquine, the, uh, eventually ivermectin wasn't part of that trial. Um, none of those have been proven to work in terms of morbidity and mortality. The famous remdesivir seems to show that there is a situation where um, people can have less days inside a hospital, but it's not affecting overall mortality. The only medication right now this, that is seemingly having some relative advantage over the others is dexamethasone under special conditions and under special populations. So I think it's important that we stress that, uh, that there is no specific treatment months into the pandemic. Um, Ministry's perspective on the gatherings that happened yesterday. Um, we, we had addressed this partially yesterday. I, I didn't follow all really the meetings or videos or photos of everything that happened yesterday, but I don't think it's, I think it's important that we continue to stress and overemphasize the issues around um, physical distancing, the issues around wearing a mask properly and not being where you don't need to be. I mean, we are going to continue to stress for all intents and purposes if you can stay home or if you're leaving your home, it has to be for an essential reason. Anything other than that is going to put us at a higher risk and you are noticing the numbers. The, the trends are really not going anywhere. We had initially said that because of the anticipated flu season that's coming in the first portion of November, we anticipate to have higher numbers um, towards the last two weeks in November. So if you have a situation like yesterday that is a potential super spreader, and I know people are cons concerned about being able to vote for election day by the 11th, but if you have an increasing amount of events that can lead to potential infection exposure, then you can anticipate you're going to have higher numbers of cases around election day. Uh, frontline workers, are there more cases at the Carl Huchner? No, there are, are a couple of more cases at the private facility in Belize City. Um, which the, I don't have the full report of that, but I do know that a couple of other cases have appeared at um, a private facility in Belize City. Um, allegations that another chicken producer may be experiencing a spreader cluster, any truth to this? We are aware of one case from a production facility in Spanish Lookout that was documented for us on Tuesday and uh, the team Im immediately went into an investigation. We did not find any other person that was symptomatic or that there would be a potential cluster at that particular um, facility. Um, one thing that I think addresses based on the questions that are coming is recall that we had said initially that after 14 days, the evidence suggests that if you had signs or symptoms, um, you are more than likely not going to be an infectious person. Um, that if you have been asymptomatic after 10 days, you are more than likely not an infectious person. And so that um, in some situations then, um, in some countries, after 10 days, if you did not develop any sign or symptom, you routinely would have been allowed to go back to your routine activities without necessarily getting a swab to confirm that you are negative by the lab. This we had discussed, remember we had gone from doing two negatives to one negative, 
um, the determination we made as a team yesterday at headquarters is that we are going to swab you at day 14 and if you are negative we will swab you again at day 21 if you are still positive we more than likely will be giving you a clearance note from the Ministry of Health based on science that you are no longer an infectious person and you can reincorporate to your routine activities, of course, taking all the precautions. Because the science suggests that after 14 days, whatever you're picking up in the nostrils may be viral particles that are not necessarily infectious, so that people are able to go back to do their routine activities. I know some people want to see it in, in writing, but uh, I'm telling you that after day 21, and I'm saying this because we have a gentleman that I think is now at day 49 down in Nangriga, and he has gotten five or six swabs and they're still positive and he has not been allowed to move and the the science would not indicate that there's a reason for keeping somebody for such an extended period in a quarantine area because you are no longer infectious particularly if he is not symptomatic so the cutoff time for us as we move along is going to be day 21. Um, so I'm going to go to the questions that I'm getting from Diomne by, via WhatsApp. Um, I mean, you're going to use the technology, I guess. <laughs> um, it's a per somebody's personal WhatsApp, actually. <laughs> how many people are in quarantine facilities and how many are quarantined supposedly at home? Uh, understand that we no longer have quarantine facilities across the country. The one we had in, in San Ignacio, the one we had um, in Corozal or in Chihuahua, those are not routinely available now. Uh, people who require quarantine are usually um, the border jumpers and those kinds of elements. Those are being sent to the um, place up in, the, in Pine Ridge. Um, also note that uh, uh, when the new SI came into play through the weekend, I can't recall the number of that SI, uh, Belizeans who were being asked to come back um, and once they had a negative result, we are recommending that you do levels of self-quarantine, but it is no longer mandated in the law for Belizeans to go and do the 10-day quarantine. And the reason why that came up specifically is because people arriving at least have either a PCR test or a rapid test. So the deliberation was, well, you have a good amount of Belizeans out there that have never gotten any kind of test and are still just walking around um, in the general public. So that's the reason why it was not no longer placed as a portion in the law, but that rather it is recommended. So we strong, it's just like when we tell you, to come with a PCR. It's not in the law. It's not a requirement. We strongly recommend that you bring one because it facilitates your process flow at the airport. Um, and also because I assume that if you turn out to be positive wherever you are, you will no longer travel. You are minimizing exposure of people as you move on to, to come here. Um, so I think it's important we say that. It's just like when Belizeans ask us, we strongly recommend that you don't travel anywhere for vacation. I mean, it's, the airport is open, people can still go, but it's a strong recommendation. If you don't have to go anywhere, well, uh, until things are clearing up, and I'm being very careful about saying this as well, because neighboring Mexico just yesterday declared that they are now starting with what they think is going to be their second uh, major wave um, coming along. So even neighboring Chetumal that has more than 200 people that have died from the, when their epidemic started, their numbers have started to increase. And at least eight states in Mexico out of their 30 states would have um, had um, situations where they're starting to spike again. Um, the infographic says test done, but this is not the same as people tested. Um, yes, we have always said that if you go, uh, I guess people will be following the infographic then. If you go to the specific infographic posted on Monday evening, there is a note in there where it says the actual amount of people that have been tested since the be be beginning of the epidemic of testing in Belize. Um, it, and again, one of the reasons why we don't load up the infographic is because when you have so much information in, in one infographic, it, it really takes away from the gist of what you want to, the message you want to immediately communicate to others. 
So that was published um, on Monday. That gives you the test. It gives you the distribution by urban rural. If you go also to the graphics that we posted on Monday, it talks about mortality by age group and cases by age group. If you notice, we posted three different infographics so that people can get a gist of the situation in there. We also had posted one in terms of frontline workers. So th those things are moving along. Um, bear with us because the epidemiology unit, that's, these are not the only things they do. Uh, it's a lot of other information, I think, on our uh, parallel page, Ministry of Health Belize, we did also infographics in terms of births, deaths, uh, comorbidities, tra road traffic accidents, suicide data, all of that data is being fed um, in real time as well. Um, what's the procedure for a person traveling for medical reasons? One is um, you. everybody needs to send a request, and mind you, it's not the Director of Health Services that gives authorization. There's a process that we keep repeating to everybody. So even though it's ultimately going to come to my desk or whoever is and deputizing for me when, when I'm not around, whoever is reviewing the data, you have to submit your information to the DHS office at health.gov.bz with the reasons why you're traveling, where you are traveling to, and who is requesting the PCR. And I, this is very important because we have now noted that some people are requesting the PCR because they don't want to go on quarantine wherever they are going, not because the country is mandating that you bring a PCR. In terms of Guatemala, they have a requirement. So that means you should not land there or they will deny you entry unless you get a PCR test. So it's very important that we see that. So once you have submitted the reason why you're going, preferably a referral letter either from the doctor here or the receiving doctor wherever you are going, um, patients who are going for follow-up, those are easy. We have a good amount of patients who have cancer or some heart condition are going over to the Mexican side. Those are easy processes. But as I said, when you're going to Mexico, you don't need a PCR test. Um, for residents of Belize returning, is it mandatory they have to be quarantined for 10 days? As I said, it's not in the law. It is, a, I would say, a strong recommendation. And I'll tell you what I would do if I'm the one coming back home or I'm coming back to Belize, what would I do if I'm returning? If I don't bring my PCR, I know that I will be getting a rapid test. I would not mix and mingle with anybody really for the next 10 days. On, on, and if they, I develop any sign or symptom, then seek medical care at a public health facility. That's the ideal because you're minimizing exposure to your family and your friends because Arriving with a negative test, getting tested and you're testing negative at the airport doesn't really put you in the clear. There's a high risk, you probably don't have it, but you still could have gotten infected on your way here. So you would have been captured in the window period and you would not necessarily turn out to be as a positive case. It's important that, that we say that. Um, so if you want to travel to the US, um, does it have to be for an emergency? No, you may leave. But I am not recommending that you go, and, I'm, and I keep saying this. Same issues with bars, gyms, restaurants, and churches. Um, I have always said I love bars, um, restaurants, gyms, but I personally am not going. I, I mean, the only restaurants I go to ones that are open air and that don't have any uh, huge amounts of persons. So can you go? Would I go to the U.S.? Then I always place myself in a position. What I would answer that question for myself. Would I go to the U.S. right now? unless it's an emergency situation. That's the only reason why I would go. Can the rest of the persons go? You can go. Understand that you're at your own risk that you are taking, and you do not need a PCR, right? I mean, people can go. There's no reason for... But we are recommending that you don't. That's personal recommendation, if you would. Um, are false negative results in PCR tests being considered in those persons returning? Does the screening team at the PGA manage persons coming from COVID hotspots, high-risk persons, any differently? Yes, depending on where you come from. Uh, even if you're being a negative PCR, notes are clear. You may be subjected to further screening, be it with another PCR test or with a um, rapid test. That's determined upon arrival. Uh, false negative results can happen, but that would be the same position as people in Belize that may get me having a false negative um, result. 
um, if a person is still testing positive after 21 days, can and should they return to work if they don't have symptoms? As I said, going forward, the memo we are drafting from my desk later on today will be that after day 21, we will issue you an, a letter. Of course, unless you're visibly ill. I mean, if you're ill or having any kind of symptom or having sequelae of COVID-19, then of course, you're going to get an extended sick leave. But if not, we will give you a clearance note that you can go back to work even if you have a negative PCR test. We more than likely are not going to screen you again. Um, how many people have been tested with rapid tests since the PGA reopening? I would say that's close to 2,500 perhaps um, because about 47% of those that arrive are arriving with a PCR test. So you would only screen the remaining 53%. Um, <laughs> Is it a fact that Chetamal has also found cases of leprosy? Um, very interesting question. I I can tell you the Belize context. We reported a leprosy case in 2017. We reported a leprosy case in 2019. So it's not that it is something that's totally uh, away from a Belize population. I believe those patients have now been cured. Mexico, the last I checked, had 182 cases reported of leprosy in 2019. So the, f the fact that uh, Yucatan and Quintana Roo are now reporting, I haven't seen their epic curve to determine whether it's higher than in previous years, but they have been reporting leprosy cases as well. I don't know if it's specifically in Chetumal. Um, can you confirm if we are able to do self-isolation at home upon entering the northern border with presenting a PCR test? Yes, if you bring a PCR test, but uh, let's make it very clear. If you do not bring a PCR test and you're coming through the western border, through the northern border, you will get a test and you will have to wait for your result at a hotel in quarantine. And that, that, that has not changed. Um, the, but what I can confirm is that if you do bring a PCR test, you, you will be allowed to come uh, through and finish uh, and you go home then. Um, are we able to coordinate our own transportation from the northern border to our home? Yes, you can coordinate that. Um, it doesn't have to be a designated transportation as is happening at the airport. Um, Ten me members of the Verdes delegation tested positive, unfortunately, because I was hoping to have watched that game. That is not going to happen, it seems. They were likely asymptomatic when they travel. Is this alarming that such a small sample group can produce so many positives? No, that's the norm. Once you have a positive, and especially in football, um, that can happen. Uh, I don't know where these persons would have gotten infected, though, because my understanding is, except for two persons that I know went one week ago, I understand that all of this team was concentrated in Cancun, for almost three to four weeks, and that they ha did have people from different entities come into the Verdes football team playing grounds, and they played friendly matches with a team in Cancun. It could have been that's where they became infected, but once you have one positive case, and if you have not been routinely being screened, then people will train without a mask, people will eat without a mask, I don't know what their sleeping quarters were, so that, that's a super spreader situation because it's a, it's a cluster. It's like what happened with the BDF when you had, what, 27 out of 80? Similar situation here. Um, as I said, I, it doesn't seem that they would have gotten infected if they all were in Cancun for the last three or four weeks. And it probably got infected somewhere there. Um, we did not screen them, I need to say that, when they left the country. We, we only screened the last two persons that left and they were negative. Um, what's This is an interesting question and we keep getting asked, will public offices working elections be tested before returning back to work? I was asked why don't we test them before they go and work for elections? Because the trick part here is that how will we able to ascertain, let's say we, you swab them, I don't know how many people work for elections, you swab a hundred people um who work for elections how will you know who got infected by working the election duties there's no way we will be able to ascertain that that 
is where a person became infected. If in point of fact you can have a population of 30% of people being asymptomatic, you can then anticipate maybe that out of 100 people in Orange Walk, 30 would be asymptomatic. But that might not be the case if you're doing a sampling of, let's say, Cayo, that seems to have a lower incidence slash prevalence rate. Um, I did get this question asked specifically by Elections and Boundaries and by the Public Service Union, but I have not responded. But um, the gist of my response is going to be there. While we may be able to do that, we need to know why we're specifically doing that, because I don't think we will be able to ascertain that officers got infected while working election duties. Um, the official time is very important, especially with elections 20 days away. Are persons considered negative after 21 days or are still using a negative test to make that determination? The memo we are working on right now will talk, will say that we will still test you at day 14. If you are still positive, we will test you again at day 21. If you still get a positive result, we will write a note, right? And we will classify you as being a negative case, and we will give you a note that is taking you away from the quarantine measures. And again, this is guided not by the election process, this is guided by science. I need that to be very, very clear. Other jurisdictions, they are taking 10 days. Some people are taking 14 days. This is guided by science. So we'll give you a note that specifies that because we more than likely will not be able to test you again. Um, what is the difference between a PCR and a rapid test? Um, well, one is the time that you take um, to actually process the sample, that's one. Two is the PCR has a higher sensitivity and higher specificity than the rapid tests. But I need to stress this, that even among rapid tests, there's many rapid tests that are out in the market. We are working with the ones that seem to be consistently having a higher sensitivity, higher specificity as we move along. And the SD biosensor is the one that we have access to that seems to be meeting those requirements. It is anticipated that as you move along, you will have rapid tests that will become more efficient and we are more than likely going to be able to use them in the general population as we move along. Um, we must specify that the memo we are also cir circulating as of today it becomes effective today in terms of rapid test. And I had a discussion with a private entity before I came here is that the rapid test in the population in Belize, in the general population here, should be used only in persons who are symptomatic for SARS CoV 2 or who are the close contacts of a person who has already been confirmed positive. Those are the only conditions under which we will be doing rapid testing within the public setting, and we anticipate that those are the only conditions that private sector will be doing the actual rapid test usage, and it has to be the SD biosensor because that's the only test we have validated to date. Before anybody asks or try to cause mischief with Another rapid test, the PanBio antigen abot test, we have procured. We still have to do the validation exercise. So once that is here, that may be added to the algorithm, but it has still not been validated for use. Um, what are the ways you can catch corona on election day? Um, many ways. One is not wearing a mask properly, not doing physical distancing, doing things beyond just casting your vote and going home. I think that's perhaps the easiest way to catch coronavirus is if people go and linger around the polling station. I think our civic duty, and I'm stressing that our civic duty should be, we go, cast our vote, walk out of the polling station and go home. I don't see any reason why anybody, and I'm saying this as a person who has worked election duties and somebody who has voted is I anticipate going to go vote early. Yeah, take your ID. You don't have to take any other thing. You don't even have to take your mobile device because your mobile device catches around. This This is full of, of bacteria and stuff. All you need to do is take your ID, present yourself, take your mask for the, what, 
10 seconds, if you will, that is going to take for people to identify you. Put your mask, mask back on, dip your finger, go get your ballot, put whatever you need to put, walk back out, go home. Wash your hands as soon as you get home, and whether it will, it's a holiday for most of, of, of persons, but it should not be a complicated process. Even the discussion I have had with returning officers, with election clerks, I think it was last week, Wednesday, is I was trying to get the message across that I know people are concerned about the ink and people are concerned about the pencil or the ballot box. That's not proven to be a primary source of infection or infections that are driven. The primary sources are going to be primarily talking without a mask, especially if you're the one who's positive, and breathing. But if you're wearing your mask and keeping your physical distance, and as I said, no reason for you to be having discussions or talking with anybody really. Um, so the process should be a rather smooth one. Because at the end of the day, beyond that, you also have to be mindful of the election persons, the public officers doing, conducting the actual election process. So out of respect for them as well, and as I was explaining to election clerks and returning officers, is provided those provisions are kept. You have all the right to make sure people are always wearing a mask when they're coming into the polling station. Um, you will have a lot of people coming in, but as long as they're just following that process of coming by, you verifying who they are, um, you allowing them to dip finger in, in the ink, taking their ballot, going to go and cast their ballot and then place it in the, in the ballot box when they're finished. The risk is really, I mean, it's not going to be there if we all follow that process, both from the officers conducting the election and the persons who are actually casting their vote. Um, I think this is the last question. It says, if a business is asked to close because of an outbreak, because most have us tested positive, how soon can they reopen and will someone from health confirm that they have been properly sanitized before opening? Uh, yes, we will tell people that they have closed. I know um, the endoscopy center, I, I, they have, I can't recall what the exact name is, they are closed. Um, so I, we will be working close um, with them to see when they have actually, um, they are been declared as, as a negative person that they are going to go back and, and be able to work. I know the situation at DFC was specifically asked again of us yesterday. I spoke with the HR person late last night. Uh, she has confirmed that they have decided to close until the end of the month. Um, they were um, checked by public health here and they were determined that the risk of having passed on the infection to others, general public was, was practically non-existent. Um, so I, I think they followed the due process. We should not be having a problem in terms of that. Uh, and health did ensure that they were going to go through the proper sanitization uh, process. So, I mean, the fact that they are going to close for two weeks is in itself a sanitization process because any virus would not have survived by the time they basically come back. Uh, that's from this particular entity. Um, I think those are all the questions that we have for now. Um, we'll see what the, the notes are for later on today. Let me see if there's any other thing. Um, uh, yeah, the clearance. I, I, well, I'm getting the notes now from the team. Based on what I have said, a lot of people are waiting clearance over 21 days with positive results. That's a memo that will go out of my desk. Um, don't get too hasty, people from health. We'll go and I, once you get the memo, we clarify that. But I'm just throwing it out because... You have to start sensitizing people as to what is going to happen. Um, and yes, I have the total figures now in terms of the infographic. Preliminary figures, that is, record number of tests would have been 437 PCR tests done today. That's a record number of samples processed. The preliminary data is that we would have 58 new cases for today. Spending confirmation, but it's a total of 437 tests processed. That's the highest number in one single day. Um, staff does work on the weekends. I know people were saying it doesn't seem so. We do work on the weekends. The second highest number of PCR tests were actually reported on a Saturday. Um, so that's what we have for now. 70 recovered cases so far. So that's when you start tipping the balance, when you have more recovered than 
cases that are positive. One other final note, perhaps I know people are concerned about the election process, but re in reality, if we all uh, keep physical distancing, if we all wear our mask properly, we are, what, 19 days away from election, something like that. If we all do that, we could very well be COVID free, can't we, by election time? So we won't be having this discussion and having an extra headache. I know it's not a, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm just showing out what what the possibilities are and, and where we are if we follow the due process. So thank you very much.